Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is so wonderful that we've got a, a, um, some amazing um, therapists that are, that are joining us today for our second allied health professional uh, webinar as part of WIFPICS. So um, very exciting. Um, can I just ask that everyone keep their, um, their uh, sound on mute um, and also um, if they are going to make any comments through or ask any questions if they could put their, their name and the country they come from that'd be much appreciated thank you very much it just makes it a lot e easier for us um, so we're gonna um, I'll be handing over to our wonderful presenters shortly um, as I say we have an hour now so obviously they'll do the presentations and hopefully there'll be time for questions um, at the end of the presentation um, okay so I'm going to hand over now to Kath and to Caroline Kath Hubbock is a registered health place specialist. She qualified in 2001 and has worked in a number of hospitals in the UK. She is currently based at Great Ormond Street Hospital for children and she's worked in PICU and with a palliative care team. Um, she's, written, she's written about the role of health place specialists and has also spoken at national and international conferences on the subject, including the importance of normalizing play as part of the health place specialist role and the theoretical approaches to understanding children's lived experiences of illness and treatment. Caroline Potter is a senior child life specialist in both um, outpatient cardiac clinic and the pediatric cardiac intensive care unit at the John Hopkins Children's Centre in Baltimore. She also has adjunct faculty uh, member of the Family Studies and Community Development Department of Towson um, University in Maryland. Thank you very much to the two of you and I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. You need to Sorry, mute. you're muted. <laughs> Carrie, just your mute if that's okay. If yes, oh, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Trying to do too many things at once. Um, so I'm Carrie Potter. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Sarah said, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I work in the cardiac intensive care unit and the cardiac clinic at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And in just a few minutes, you'll meet Kath as well. So we're going to start today by offering a definition for play. So play is any spontaneous or organized activity that provides enjoyment, entertainment, amusement, or diversion. And hopefully we can all picture children at play. Babies might be exploring textures and different sensory experiences, toddlers throwing balls, preschoolers using crayons and glue, kids in school playing games at recess, maybe teenagers creating art, playing video games. Often these are really routine experiences of childhood and development whose importance could be overlooked. These play experiences are really important and probably many people in this um, meeting right now are well acquainted with why play is so important to children, but we want to talk about how they help move children through the stages of development, how they provide opportunities for emotional expression, and that they support children's ability to cope with the challenges that they might encounter. So, one of the things I hear my OT colleagues say at the hospital is that play is the occupation of children. So when we think about the implications of not playing on children's development, their emotional state, and their coping, the need for play in the hospital hopefully should seem very apparent. Play is one of the rights of children as outlined in the United Nations Conventions on the Right of Child. We offer this quote from Platt. When a child is in the hospital, she is in danger of losing contact with the outside world, which up to that time has become a mainstay of her development. <clears throat> We're gonna try to play this video and if there isn't sound, Kath will talk us through it. Let's see how we go. Okay, so I'm gonna, guess that you can't hear this video, which is a shame. This is a two minute clip from some research that was being done in the mid to the late 1950s here in, in England, in the UK. Um, it was being conducted by the Robertsons, James and Joyce Robertson, who were researchers working alongside 
John Bowlby. I can now slightly hear it, but I'm gonna carry on anyway. They looked at children in a number of different residential settings, including hospitals. And they were interested because they were working alongside Bowlby, the main focus of their research was about attachment, bonding and separation from mother for all from main carers. And so children in hospital provided a very rich observational ground for the Robertsons to look at what happens when children are separated from their parents, particularly their mothers. Um, but we now understand attachment so differently that actually we, we know that that extends to other family members and people key to children's lives. So they looked at this little girl, Laura, who is two. She went into hospital to have her tonsils taken out, which in 1958 meant you went into hospital for two weeks without your parent. They may have visited you once or twice, but they were not allowed on the ward where you were resident. And they watched with interest those children to see what happened when they were separated from their families. The outcome of the work that was being done in England at that time, and I believe there was work being done around the world in the US, in Canada and in Australasia at the same time, looking at the same issues. And I'm guessing coming up with some very similar conclusions, which was ultimately that children's healthcare had to change because it was not, um, it may have been attending to children's physical health in a very efficient way. And now for us in the UK, in the NHS meant that it was free and accessible for all, um, but it was not attending to their emotional, psychosocial well-being because children were um, affected significantly in the short, mid and long term by hospitalisation. Why this is a significant film for Carrie and I is that out of this work at this point in time came changes to children's health care. Firstly, and most significantly really, was that mothers were expected or encouraged to come and stay with their children. That changed late 50s, early 60s, and is now an expectation that a child will have a parent with them. It's highly unusual to find a child in hospital as a lone pa patient. It does happen, as we all know, but it's, it's more unusual than it was then. The other thing that um, it uh, highlighted um, was that children needed ordinary things to be happening around them. So the instigation of hospital schools and hospital, hospital play programmes started from this point onwards. And that is because the Robertsons identified two main dangers that children were at risk of when they were in hospital, separated from their main carers. And they outlined these as follows. The first one, the first main danger, a risk, was the what they called the traumatic and they also identified that children not only faced significant traumatic risks in hospital, but also risks from the deprivation that they experienced in hospital. The things they missed out on, the things that were disrupted by that experience. And I think it is interesting that you look at this old research, relatively old research, and you can see a trend throughout to the present day, that children still face these two types of risk, the traumatic and the deprivational. We may not talk about them in those terms now, but when we ask the question, I wonder if you can picture your setting and think what traumatic or deprivational experiences do children on my unit experience daily? We were going to ask people to shout out, but I think that's going to get complicated. There's quite a lot of people here. But just think that through. When Carrie and I both involved or have been involved in teaching on our respective training programmes for health play specialists and child life specialists. And we have asked this question. Um, I wanted to show you a sort of um, the shout outs that I got from my students the last time I asked this question which is what is the traumatic and what is the deprivational. And eventually, 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 you get a very full board when you consider what that experience is like for children in hospital today, not just 60, 70 years ago, but now. Um, the traumatic always comes first. People are much more in tune with what that is like for children uh, with pain, um, fear of the unknown, invasive procedures, witnessing and seeing things happening around them. And when we consider this in a PICU setting, it's very significant that those things come very um, freely to that discussion. The deprivational is always harder to pinpoint because it is less overt. 
and it is less distressing to witness, I think. I think that's why it tends to be take more thinking, more, more considering of what deprivational aspects happen when children are in hospital, but they are there. The lack of physical contact, and when you think again in the PICU specific um, environment, lack of physical contact, um, the boredom that happens, the loss of any autonomy, the actual loss of physical um, ability, um, and the loss of routines, and we eventually get back to separation from everything that is the mainstay of a child's development, as Platt said. When you then consider it, you look at these little, these little micro uh, risks, if you like, that are all about over and under stimulation. So actually in a, in a hospital setting and in a PICU setting, you will also have too much light, continuous sound, possibly strong smells or, str or large, you know, significant large noises, um, movement of people all around you. That is a part of the over and under stimulation that we are worried about for children who are in hospital. And it is a fine balance between over and under stimulation. I wonder in your setting which one wins, which one is the bigger concern. And actually by being overly concerned about the traumatic, do we, do we um, end up not focusing on the deprivational aspects? There's some interesting things that come from that discussion, I think. So when we think about the potential for um, stimulation and play to be threatened in our ICU settings, we want to go beyond the idea that we need to ensure children have opportunities for play and to the idea of who ensures that that happens. Um, I really believe that people of any discipline in the hospital can and should play. Um, but where there are so many competing priorities, especially in the ICU, Employing someone whose clinical practice involves the provision of play ensures that this essential right and need of children is met. So Cap and I have a lot in common, but we do have different training and um, a different approach in some situations. And so we wanted to highlight a little bit of like what our backgrounds are and what a child life specialist role is and um, what a health care play specialist is so that everyone who's joining us from around the world can learn how we're operating what background we're coming from. So as I have said, I am a child life specialist and most child life, child life specialists are in North America. Um, there is starting to be more child life programs in hospitals around the world, but um, I think the United States and Canada have dominated the field for many years. Um, our background and educational background is in child development, family systems, the traumatic impact of health and hospital experiences. So sometimes when I listen to Kath talk about the traumatic and the deprivational, I think about um, how pieces of my training really did um, emphasize that traumatic aspect. Um, we also take classes on bereavement and grief. And everything is really grounded in play as our primary mode of working with children. Um, as a child life specialist, I take a national certification exam that I qualify for based on coursework and field work, um, and then um, can call myself a certified child life specialist. Um, and recently, the child life profession went through the process of developing a values proposition statement and determined that these six domains of the services we provide um, are sort of the core concepts related to our services. So we're resilience focused. Um, we use a trauma informed lens. Um, our work is primarily based on relationships and play and grounded in developmental theory. We always say that health play specialists and child life specialists are counterparts, which is absolutely true, but we do train very differently. Um, and in the UK, there are child life specialists working in the UK, but they have usually, they have trained somewhere else and come and worked here or relocated to the UK. The health play specialist role is one that is based mostly in the UK and Ireland. It's um, a unique, vocational training. It's a training course that you undertake to be a health play specialist and you can't be a health play specialist unless you've undertaken that training. So it is, I seem to spend a lot of my early years of being 
qualified trying to explain to people what I was a little bit like I was a bit like a teacher I was a bit like a psychologist I was a bit like a play worker in hospital then I realized actually I'm not really like any of those I am a health play specialist and that is what I trained to do and that is what I'm doing um, and it is a unique training um, course uh, currently a foundation degree a two-year course there is an option to top up to a full degree in the UK um, and it has newly been accepted as an NHS apprenticeship in some settings. We have four apprentices at GOSH in London. Um, um, but it, it, the reason it is unique um, to other childcare or health-based um, training courses is I believe it has three core parts. One is the uh, it's grounded in child development and specifically grounded in attachment theory which is why the work of Bowlby, the work of the Robertsons is so key. Um, then you add into that the uh, importance of play and, and childhood development. Um, those two get fused together. And then the reason it is unique is it has a third element, which is that everything is seen through the lens of understanding what those normal parts of child development, how they become affected by um, the experience for, for a child of being sick, injured, being in hospital, requiring a healthcare experiences in their life. What happens to the, that normal developmental um, pathway when a child becomes sick and needs to go into hospital for a period of time? Um, so all of our training is looking at that anew. So you may have a lot of experience of working with children, a lot of experience in play work, but the key that gels it together is what happens when children are in hospital and how do we counter some of those things through play, through a playful approach. Um, it's taken a long time to get some recognition. I think we're still a work in progress. But in 2003, the National Service Framework for Children for the NHS in the UK recommended that all children staying in hospital should have daily access to a play specialist. So when I think about, as a child life specialist, the primary functions in any setting of the hospital, I think about providing different types of play. So normalizing developmentally supportive play, and then medical play and therapeutic play. I provided a couple pictures of just some of the different equipment that we might use or things we might create um, in the, the process of um, providing medical play to children. Um, we also have a well-defined and researched pro um, process of psychological preparation, and it really goes beyond, I think, a lot of um, colleagues hear preparation and they think about the provision of procedural information to a child, and really our process of psychological preparation is much more than that. Um, a research study done at Phoenix Children's Hospital that created a clinical manual for child life specialists outlined a seven step process that included information sharing, but also providing sensory information, development of coping strategies and a plan for coping, and was really focused on um, preparing children for medical procedures. Child life specialists also provide procedural support, so presence and um, support for coping mechanisms during medical procedures, um, as well as education about diagnoses, um, and support to families and siblings of children in hospital as well. Um, I would imagine that this is where our day-to-day -day work looks very similar. So our training ground is different, but actually our provision for children in hospital is, is very similar, I think, Carrie. Um, mm -hmm. And health play specialists really are grounded in normalising play. There's a recognition that the hospital for most children um, is not a normal environment it is different to the places where the development would usually be happening very naturally um, and so play is used as a bridging tool a, 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 a resource to try to bridge the normal experiences and environments that children move in and the very abnormal environment of the of the hospital for some children we know that the hospital becomes their normal and that is a different issue again, uh, and a different concern. But certainly for most children visiting the hospital, play is the way to say, it's okay, you can still be you here. You can still do what you like to do here. Um, even if you're sick, even if we need to fix you, we can help you still do the things that keep you feeling like it's okay. Um, 
But then we do equally use specialised and focused play, particularly medical play, end of life support. And, um, uh, you know, I spend a lot of my time doing distractions with children, which means going into treatment rooms, um, into clinical procedures with them and helping them cope as possible <laughs> through those, whether that's a simple blood test or a very complex um, dressing change or whatever. Um, you know, alongside normalising play, the two key things for me are that play specialists give children information um, and that can be that will be different for every child. But we like to, we, you know, we believe that children will cope better if they know what is going to happen to them, what they should expect, what is normal in this environment and how we're all going to cope with it together. Um, there's a really collegiate approach when it works well with children to say, let's do this together. How, how should we do this to make this easier or better or different to before? And then that's when we move into that emotional support where we accompany children through the, some of the biggest challenges of their lives, really. Um, sometimes that is reduced just to distraction, but actually all, I mean, I think it is very true that all play in hospital is specialised play because of the unique environment that children are now in, that it is so abnormal to their normal environment, if you like. So all play, whether that is just playing Play-Doh at the table, if it's being done by someone with specialist training, it is specialised play that is an important space for observing and considering what's happening for this child and where they might need assistance and help as their admission goes on. So we wanted to also just sort of um, focus in on beyond our sort of broader functions, how does that role translate into the ICU? Um, I've been working as a child life specialist for about 12 years at this point, and there are many times that people are like, well, what do you do when you work in that type of an environment? Because they can understand the role, but not in an ICU setting. Um, and really, it doesn't vary, but it does um, sort of have much more specific um, needs and roles when you're working in that type of an environment. I think there's so much value in providing the um, psychosocial assessment of a child and family in the ICU setting. It's such a strange environment, as Kath has said. Um, you know, they're really out of their norm. They're probably going through the greatest crisis that they have ever um, endured. And having someone who's um, doing an assessment from the lens of a child life specialist um, really can identify things about the child and family where we can provide even greater support in that environment. Um, the healthcare experiences that children undergo in the ICU certainly are um, frequently the most intense that occur throughout the hospital, um, depending on like levels of sedation that are used in different ICUs. Um, providing psychological preparation for those is key. Um, especially I find that there are children who are too sick to have certain levels of sedation and it might not you know, feel particularly safe to give them additional pain medication or sedation medication. And so being prepared and having a coping plan um, becomes even more important in those types of situations. Um, the development and use of coping mechanisms during medical procedures, but also just for the stay in the environment. Um, that's something that is a part of our process of preparation, but also um, just with the experience of being in the hospital and spending the night and everything that goes with that. Um, we provide play at the bedside, including that goal-directed therapeutic and medical play. And I think that for children who are encountering such novel experiences, um, being able to explore medical equipment in a non-threatening way is extremely important and valuable. And then also to have therapeutic play opportunities for the expression that might occur um, in that type of a supported experience. We also promote development. In my current position in the cardiac ICU, um, I work with a large infant population who are working towards um, new milestones at a pretty fast pace. And, you know, there's a big chance of not achieving those on a typical timeline um, when you're spending a significant period of time in the ICU. And so we're a part of a team that is helping infants to achieve those milestones. Um, and then the parent and sibling support. I think that 
we can never discount the impact of a child being in the, the intensive care unit on the entire family system. Um, that might mean that the sibling is having less contact with their parents. It means that the parent might be feeling the pull of spending time between two places where two children are. It might mean that siblings are coming into that ICU environment for the first time and encountering everything that's happening um, around their uh, brother or sister. We also provide bereavement and loss support in the intensive care environment and collaboration with the multidisciplinary team is a part of everything that we do. Um, two things that were really unique, um, I have worked both in the PICU at Johns Hopkins and the cardiac ICU at Johns Hopkins, um, are that in our ICU we actually have had a play space and the child life specialist really is the person who maintains that play space as a space for children. And um, having a space outside of children's rooms um, for them to go and explore is such a valuable thing. So it'd be interested if anyone has a play space, you should definitely drop it in the chat. I'd love to see that later to see where that is happening. Um, but we've been able to have children um, go to our play space with medical equipment that um, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily think of taking to a playroom and there's just, when you've been in the same four walls for a long period of time, that change of scenery, the opportunity to explore in an open way, a lot of play materials um, is really key to the point where we are working on a new and improved larger play space for our ICU populations. We also, part of that um, need for a play space is because we have had a focus on early mobilization and ICU liberation on the units that I've worked on here. So we contribute a lot to the early mobilization work, using play as a motivator for mobilization. Um, and for, you know, that could be mobilization like walking and being um, like out and about, but also mobilization like sitting in a chair, sitting in bed in the chair position, um, engaging in play, sitting at the edge of bed, um, and part of that has been that we've really reduced the amount of sedation we're using. Um, I've had children as young as three be able to tolerate uh, being intubated with an endotracheal tube and sitting at the edge of bed playing, doing water play in a basin um, with different medical equipment. So um, the piece of adding the ICU liberation program really emphasized and expanded the patients that really benefited from having a child life specialist spend time at their bedside engaging in play. Um, I would love a play space. <laughs> the work in progress. Um, and I've been, I've been to Carrie's ICU and I was really impressed. It didn't feel like an ICU to me. It had a really good interesting feel to it and um, with the thought of a play space in a PICU is just amazing really. Um, I as um, Sarah said right at the beginning, I've been a play specialist for 20 years now, but I've actually only been working in a PICU for, for a year. So I've come with a really interesting, you know, I kind of know my own role, but having to then apply it quickly to a new area and an area that is as intense as an intensive care um, ward has been interesting. So I see that these are the roles of play specialists working in, in an intensive care unit uh, from my perspective. <clears throat> is that first and foremost, we do uphold the right of babies, children and young people to play. That is really at the core of what we're doing all the way through. But out of that comes the assessment and provision of play activities according to children's individual needs and appropriate to their development. And as Carrie said, I, I also have a lot of babies and a lot of toddlers and they are rapidly developing when they're not in hospital, whether they're sick children or, or well children. Um, their development is still ongoing and actually supporting that through their severe illness uh, or their period of um, recovery from a severe illness is, is still extremely important. And of course, has a lot of things disrupting or potentially risking that and disrupting that. Um, and I see my role partly to mitigate that risk and that disruption through the provision of appropriate play um, activities for sort of kids and whatever. Um, to support children and young people within the PICU environment, um, particularly before, during and after invasive medical procedures, of which there are 
a lot. It's a, a repeated thing that happens to children in that environment. Um, that might involve discussion, preparation for procedures if the child is able to engage, um, but it will certainly involve emotional support including verbal reassurance, sort of narration through procedures, talking with children before and during what is going to happen, especially if their sensory experience of PICU is, is, is which it is, is going to be very affected. And sometimes when you're uh, on a, a, a number of medications for quite sedated, you may not know that somebody touching your foot there is still your foot which I think probably doesn't make sense unless we've maybe either witnessed that or been in that position ourselves. But sometimes children really just need you to say, that's just me touching you here. This is still part of you. Um, and to hear what is happening around them. So much is happening, but to, to help them understand what is happening. As children also become less sedated, more awake, um, distraction can be key for protecting the IV lines that are going in to keeping them calm, to keeping them um, as, um, to keeping distress as minimal as possible um, in that space. Um, I would say that we also offer support and assistance to the whole family, including siblings, um, to cope with the enormity of an admission to a PICU with their child. Um, and especially if the child is drawing towards the end of their life, that whole family support comes into a different, um, onto a different level really. Um, it is, we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID in a minute, but that is one of the things that's been most disrupted by COVID. Um, the ability to have siblings and other family members in, in the PICU environment has just been almost wiped out unless a child is at the end of their life. And then it takes on a whole new significance really. Um, or play specialists also will be contributing to discussions around a child's care with all the members of the multidisciplinary team, advocating for children's rights, the right to play particularly, and also any other needs that we observe. And we contribute to training and education across the multidisciplinary team, which is always a pleasure. Um, some of the biggest barriers, I think, having thought about all of those things, in the PICU environment are um, the child's, firstly, the child's acute condition always needs consideration. Um, but out of that comes sometimes an, uh, a misunderstanding with both staff and also with families around the importance and the intricacy of play. Play specialists and child life specialists are well experienced in looking for small play cues in the way children are behaving. Is a child looking for play? Is a child responsive to your presence when you're there? Would, what would they like to do? Are they able to make a choice? Are they able to, to express that they would like something, to, something different in their environment that is um, going to be helpful for them on that particular occasion? Whether that is watching something, listening to something, or actually having some play activities brought to them that they can observe or join in with. Um, but sometimes there is a sense of, no, this child is far too ill, they can't possibly participate. And overcoming that barrier, that sometimes is right, but overcoming that barrier, testing that out is very important and noticing little, little cues for play all the way through. Out of that comes issues with communication, which for a lot of children are just very real, very practical. They can, if you have a tube in, you cannot speak. So you can't express what's really going on. But I think it's important to, to a, um, establish early whether a child can um, express a yes and a no response and what that is and to share that within the team that has just as of last year become a um, specific point that's made in some nice guidelines here um, around uh, establishing how children want or choose to communicate um, and it's important to know what that would have been before they came into hospital and how that may be different now, because for some children, if they have a communication issue anyway, their yes and their no will may not have changed very much. They may use Makaton, they may use a, a machine uh, that, that they, you know, some technology that helps them with that. And they may still be able to do all of those things. For children who otherwise would be verbal, we may have to find some ways that work for them, whether it's a thumbs up and a thumbs down, whether it's pointing, whether it's head nodding and shaking, which may also be impaired by the machinery we have helping them. 
So communication difficulties are an issue, but they are so important to try to fix if we possibly can early on. Um, the other barriers are parental fear, fears and concerns. I think it's overwhelming for a lot of parents and they wonder, can my child still play? Can I still play with them? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I won't. Maybe this is all too frightening. The other issue that is a huge issue, but it appears to be a minor issue until you start trying to introduce play is positioning is um, so difficult. If a child is in a very fixed position, if they're only able to look in one direction and that direction is nowhere near where the play can happen, how are you going to position yourself, other people and play resources so a child can at the very least see what you've brought for them? And also a child who is perhaps still quite um, restricted through the medication that they're on, may not actually be able to move very much to, to take hold of a car or a pencil. And when they have got hold of it, they may not be able to see their hand holding the car or the pencil or the teddy. So you have to be able to work around those positioning differences and always be thinking, what can they see? What can't they see? What do I need? How do I need to move to be there? There's a lot of putting lying alongside the child to work and also working out from where their eyes are looking. Where do I need to put things so that they can at least see what's happening? Um, I always feel like I can do my job really well as long as I can find the right trays, trays and boxes <laughs> and things and magnetic stuff and things to hang and whatever. So, yeah, is this you, Carol? Is this me? Is this me? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, so with that in mind, with those barriers in mind, the things that I would be considering when I'm planning play, firstly, the child's condition, their medical status, actually, are they able to play today? There are some days where genuinely everybody is stated and ventilated. And I think, OK, but I always think, well, tomorrow could be very different. Today, this is how this is, but tomorrow is a very different day for some of these children. So what will they need? How do I get to know parents? How do I start those conversations early? Um, patient family goals and motivation. Actually, what 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 is a child like? What do they like? Or what do they what do they not like? Um, and that's especially important for children who've got additional needs anyway. Actually, how did they play before they were in the PICU? How would you like to play? How would they like to play now? How can we accommodate that? And anything sensory or sound wise that is not acceptable? How do, what do we need to know? But also what are those little likes? The things they really love on the TV might be the one thing that just hooks them into a little bit of a play communication as they begin to wake up. The reassurance that they're still Paw Patrol the reassurance they can still play a computer game or watch somebody else playing it um, could be enough to just gain that trust and then you're in with more involvement with them as their condition improves. Um, an understanding of the child's condition and any, um, any uh, particular considerations we have to make around that, their age and their developmental level. Where would, would they have been, are they developmentally appropriate, which is a phrase I don't particularly like, because it means that it still means nothing. It still means the same different <laughs> for every child. But actually, are they where we would be roughly expecting them to be at the age they are? Has something been affected by either the immediacy of what's happened to them, their illness or injury, or in fact, did they have additional needs before? And then considering our policies I mean I don't have policies about going off the unit but I would love to try and find some but also lots and lots about contact precautions um, health and safety um, handling patients and also infection control obviously is around a lot even more so than normal at the moment so there's a lot of things to consider but you just get used to doing it so I think that sometimes people wonder if children in the ICU can play and Kath and I are telling you definitely yes. Um, and this is really where like having an experienced play practitioner who can really identify those opportunities, like what Kath was saying about picking up on the most subtle cue for preference and control, um, as this quote from Deb Vilas, who was um, someone who trained me in grad school and I know Kath has, I think, learned from as well. Um, so where are those opportunities to allow children to experience play, no matter what barriers other people, including sometimes parents, um, might be seeing first. And one of the examples I like to share related to this is 
that a few years ago in the United States, we had um, several patients in a short period of time with acute flaccid myelitis. And these were previously healthy children who lost some all the way to most of their motor control. And I remember having conversations with parents around supporting their child's ability to play. And there were elements of doubt on whether that could happen for their child in their current medical status. And it took a lot of creativity to identify um, specific play plans for each child. Perhaps they primarily engaged using just a foot or a toe, or perhaps most of their play occurred through them expressing some preferences. So that's where those yeses and nos can be so important. Um, and another person was actually moving the doll through the dollhouse or the car across the bed. Um, but everything had to be really uniquely geared to the patient. And often parents were learning to partner in play in new ways. And so for any of us to take that eye for those cues and to really look for all those subtle um, expressions, we can be that perfect playmate who can help them play no matter what their bodies can or cannot do. So when we think about all these unique plays, we're really having play needs. We're having to really adapt to each child. And I think that every child in the ICU has some unique play need and we have to adapt to to some extent. Um, as Kath was talking about a little bit, the location and position of the child, the play resources, the staff members is one of the key adaptations to look for. So this could mean really thinking outside the box or using the box um, to modify how you're presenting play materials, to think about different materials that we can adapt. Um, we use tons of tables and easels and different um, boxes, clothespins um, to hang things where they can see them and um, engage with them. There are just so many different materials that you can use to modify either the environment or the toys or how we're presenting um, the position of everyone and everything in order to um, bring the play to the child and adapt it to their needs. I think that my OT colleagues are great partners in collaborating on this frequently. Um, then we wanna think about like, what types of play are we offering and engaging children in? Are we using different sensory modalities to make play more accessible to their current situation versus expecting them to play the way that they did before they were in the hospital? We want to have goals that are um, ambitious, but also realistic so that we um, gain a sense of accomplishment um, and that play sessions are pleasurable for people and not frustrating. Um, so being adapting is one of the key ways to make sure that it's pleasurable and not um, frustrating. Um, one of my favorite ways of adapting um, for children who like to do art um, sometimes art can be something that really brings up frustration, um, but I love to adapt versus using a smaller surface for art. Um, we'll hang like a sheet or something very large near the bed, um, and even a child who can barely move out of bed might be able to help push a syringe and squirt art in the, or squirt paint in the direction of the sheet. And when you're painting in that way, it's definitely much more about the process, the sensory experience and the mess. Um, so that's one of the things that I think whenever we do that on the PICU, um, there is a lot of joy happening because it's such a fun experience. Um, we also just have to reevaluate success. That's part of the um, experience over any kind of like end product and you know, maybe it achieves a goal, but our goals are realistic enough that we're able to, um, to accomplish them. And then including families, I think especially with including siblings, um, I think of a sibling who, or a patient who is extremely immobile, and one of the um, best times of her period of time in the hospital was when her brothers would come, and they would play at the bedside, and she would verbally engage, but it was primarily them, you know, playing elaborate games. And 
there was so much pleasure, even though she wasn't physically engaging with the toys because she really wasn't able to, but clearly like the mental aspect of play was something she was super engaged in. Um, and then working with colleagues, I co-treat a lot with our um, occupational and physical therapists and their sessions often put patients into new positions that they're not in at other times of the day. Um, having a child who is usually laying down sit up opens up new options for play and also the play then frequently takes their mind off of the work that's happening in the therapy session and it's always extra hands so it's always great to have um, those opportunities to co-work with my colleagues So we wanted to just touch briefly on some of the adaptations um, related to the current pandemic um, to how play is being provided. And um, I wanted to share just some of the ways that we have used virtual and remote technology. Um, we are lucky enough to have a closed circuit TV system. So in the picture, you see two colleagues who are actually doing a Heart Parts Trivia for CHD Week um, last week. And kids could call in and participate in guessing the names of different parts of the heart. Um, and they had a heart in their room um, made out of the same cutouts that they could assemble just on a smaller scale. Um, we do similar types of shows to do cooking shows. We do um, hospital bingo every week. And, you know, so there's a level of watching the TV, but also engagement because there's an activity the child is doing in their room. Um, we also have been able to work with an organization called We Go Tours, where we can have kids do virtual visits to different places around the country. So we've worked with the Field Museum and the Lincoln Park Zoo and some local places like the National Aquarium. And kids actually get to drive a robot through those places. And there's a museum um, or, you know, zoo employee who's with the robot to help sort of give them a guided experience. Um, it's a great thing that happens from the child's room. So it's, we've been able to maintain it during the pandemic. We have really switched the types of materials we're using to increase our use of disposable materials. We've slowly incorporated more of the cleanable stuff um, as we've learned more about COVID-19 but we really used things that kids could keep or that could be disposed of after they were used for um, a good portion of the last two years. We have basically closed all of our designated play spaces. Um, when they are open, they have to be open just to one child. And so the loss of that social um, play that could happen by having a play space has really been hard to, um, recreate and figure out, are there ways that patients can safely socialize um, through the use of virtual and remote technology? And I'm sure some of that reflects what's happening in um, the world at large outside of the hospital when kids are not having just the social time of being in school together. Um, most of our play really had to occur in patient rooms. So we had to have the materials to adapt to rooms. We use a ton of play mats and things like that on the units I work on so that kids can be out of bed and sit on the floor. We have high chairs so that kids can sit in that um, type of a seat in order to have toys in front of them and play. And then the changes to the presence of parents and siblings has really been challenging. Um, especially the loss of um, not having siblings be able to visit for long periods of time for us. I've found myself, I'll send things home with parents for siblings um, that, you know, they can do an activity at home and send it in, or even some of the things we would do to sort of create memories we've had to do in sort of this piecemeal of going back and forth and then um, creating something. So like we've even done like all about me's where a sibling might fill out a page about who they are that could be in the patient room so that everybody is getting to know the patient from um, a perspective of who else is in their family also. So we've reached our concluding point really. Um, we both have brought a case study, but we also want to hear your questions. So we'll conclude now and then we'll see what the 
here, Liz. I don't know what's been happening in the chat box, but um, in conclusion, um, play in a PICU setting requires really these four main things, really good communication, and that's communication with colleagues throughout the MDT, but also a good approach to communication with children, really looking for cues, really looking for eye contact play cues, um, and being um, adaptable in that communication, finding out how children can communicate and making sure that that gets used. I think being a play specialist, child life or health play specialist in this setting requires a sensitivity and an intuition um, in the midst of all of that busyness of the medicalized part of the child's care. You have to still find the child in the middle of it. And as I said earlier, all play is specialized play in this environment. And there's a curiosity about how is this child doing in the middle of all of this and their whole family, but how is the child, where is the child and how are they doing in the middle of this? And with that comes the courage then to try things, to see what works, what doesn't, to play on behalf of the child, maybe just before they're ready to join in themselves. And that's got to be better than waiting a whole day with no play to just try things out, to see what happens. Um, and it does require access to a whole range of suitable resources, um, which can be a challenge where there's not a lot of storage, I find. And, you know, you do sometimes have to have the big, the tables, the easels, the, the, and they will be stored for maybe weeks and weeks before they come back out. And, you know, actually having access to those suitable resources is, is a challenge, but it is a, ne a necessity when you're working in this space. I hope it's been helpful and interesting. Um, even as we were preparing, Carrie and I were like, oh, I've never thought of that. Oh, yeah, I should try that. <laughs> um, and so it's been really good just for us also to find out about our own professions, really. Um, and um, yeah, it's been really good to be able to talk to you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I'm just waiting to see if there's any questions come up in the chat or if people want to speak directly. I have to, I'm probably speaking on behalf of every single um, health professional who um, works I um, without an HBS or a CLS because <laughs> I feel deprived. Um, <laughs> you used about traumatic and deprivational earlier in, in, in your beautiful talk and I have to say that's something that not having this service seems amazing that we don't and it, it sounds to me like the glue that brings all of the other health professionals together. You have so many parts that are vital and um, that can bring it all together. Um, anybody got any questions there? Um, as I work on, so we've got Katrina here. Um, I work on a PCCU and already done the things mentioned. I'm doing an audit on supporting communication with children and young people. How do you support children who, who need support? Do you use communication boards, etc.? Yeah, so I um, use some things that I do myself. So like we developed a low technology communication kit um, that we did some training to familiarize our nurses with, because really we realized that um, when there's only a few speech therapists, a few occupational therapists, a few child life specialists, that the nurses are the ones who have the need to utilize these things most frequently. And so we created this kit that had both ways for children to write if that was something they were going to be able to do, but also picture based and a few um, non-picture-based um, boards that were sort of standard set things. Um, and then we use things to make boards that are custom for children if they're gonna need them for a long period of time. But those low-tech kits are super helpful when there's um, a child who's emerging from sedation, maybe they're intubated for 24, 48 more hours um, and has a need to communicate. Um, because as we started the process of lightning sedation, we really found that kids needed to communicate um, first and foremost. And especially with older kids, yes and no works to a point. But once it's hit like 24 hours, oftentimes they want to be able to communicate something more um, complex than what we're able to ask yes and no questions for. We do also, I mean, we use our OT and our SLP colleagues for higher tech communication needs, so buttons and um, 
we have a couple of um, the apps for both picture-based and voice output types of things. Um, they have an eye gaze system. So we have all access to those things um, when we need them, but those low tech kits are really honestly the like frontline first, um, first use uh, item for communication needs. Thank you. Um, any other questions there from anybody? I know um, in the chat very early on, there was a comment from Lindsay from Southampton mentioning, you know, how we're all feeling right now um, in the COVID space and the desire to get back to normal. Um, I, I think lessons learned, you mentioned and touched a little bit on COVID there, mm -hmm. but I think when you talk about traumatic versus um, deprivational, I reckon we're now far more aware of that and maybe we can take those lessons um, forward. How would you help us um, who haven't got the, your skill sets um, to ensure that we meet those needs in the current climate. Do you want to say something first, Kath, or do you want me to? <laughs> if you've got an answer worked out, go. Uh, just because I'm, I'm thinking. Um, I mean, it, it's been such a challenge. I think, I mean, I think one of the things that is a huge loss, I don't have a playroom, so actually that, that immediately is different, I think, for, for children's wards who do have a playroom. I think that's probably high on the list of things that would make a big difference straight away is if playrooms could be open, play spaces could be open. For me, it's about sibling visits and families being able to be more together mm -hmm. uh, this time, particularly where we are, a lot of families are naturally separated anyway because they come from all over the UK. So, you know, there would have been an element of that for some families, but that would make a massive difference um, to be able to do that. Um, I think on, on both that social element of play has been so blown apart by COVID really. I think that's something we um, realized before the pandemic when we started doing our ICU mobilization and liberation work was that we created our whole program for that without adding any resources. We had no additional staff to support that work. And that was a huge concern at first that like, how are we gonna do this when there's already, doesn't feel like there's enough time in the day, we're all stretched so thin anyways. And what we found was that that work was the work that was really um, filling our cups in terms of helping us to enjoy our jobs, to feel refreshed and rejuvenated. And so I think I would say to people that if you can incorporate more play into what you're doing with patients, um, even if you don't have a health play specialist, I would hope that then it would also bring joy to you and pleasure to you in the midst of doing work in a really hard environment. And we have a wonderful question here from Thomas. Um, uh, good morning, Carrie. I'm new to PCCU space and I'm keen to do more play. Could you expand on how you employ the PCCU liberation bundle in prioritizing play in the PCCU? Yeah, so I mean, basically it occurred really naturally in terms of as we um, implemented the bundle for ICU liberation and we were um, starting low and going slow on sedation, kids were more awake and we couldn't expect a three-year-old on BiPAP or a three-year-old who was intubated to lay in bed calmly with their ET tube and cope with that. They wanted to play, they needed to play, and therefore we needed to be there and we all needed to be a part of that. And, you know, I worked on a 40-bed PICU for seven years and there was one of me every day. So, everyone had to play. <laughs> um, and part of that was making sure the materials were there, making sure that we were role modeling for people because, you know, I could get some play started. And then sometimes a parent or a nurse could sustain it for a longer period of time for the child or could um, have the same type of play occur later. So, and you know, this is the work that all of our staff now loves to do. And um, whenever we present as a group about the ICU liberation work, people, there are a couple of people who talk about being the doubters. And then they're like, but then I was convinced because of a certain patient and a certain experience they had where that patient was able to cope and they then had fun. So, you know, we all need to have more fun at work and play should be fun. Wonderful, thank you. Um, from Natasha here, we currently use Zaki Hand um, 
on our intensive care unit and wondered if you have any experience in weighted blankets for older children. I know the Zaki hands provide so much comfort to our babies and have a great research behind them. Do you guys use weighted blankets at all, Kath? Not that I am aware of, no. Yeah, so I, my primary experience using weighted blankets has been with um, patients and families who have experience with them outside of the hospital. Um, sometimes they don't realize that they can bring those to the hospital with them. Um, and, you know, barring any kind of um, concern about pressure on like an abdomen or a limb or something like that. But, you know, I've used them um, for some medical procedures that were fairly invasive and we just positioned the blanket so that it was on other parts of the body. Um, but if that's, I think that's one coping tool, um, but I've primarily used ones that parents and um, children already had. I know the issue of like sanitizing them in our hospital um, has been a little bit of a barrier to being able to use them more widely. And we have Tammy from Monash in, um, uh, in Australia um, saying, um, we're finding younger children both during the um, born during the pandemic really struggling with social interactions with limited interactions with a range of different adults. What is your experience here? I think we're starting to see uh, patterns now of children who've been born during the pandemic or were very small already before, the, you know, they're now preschool, but they have not had the same socialization that they would have had. I have concerns about babies not seeing faces <laughs> for their whole life, especially if they have been born and they're sick from birth or, you know, they've been in hospital the whole time. Uh, parts of our intensive care unit are quite open. So parents also have to wear a mask. So they may not be wearing, they may not be seeing anybody's mouth moving. I have concerns about that. I would love to do some play sessions without a mask, but with a visor if, if, if I have to have something. But I've yet to be, able, every single time I've had to negotiate that there's another surge of COVID and it just, it's not, it's not even on the table. It's so far away from the table, it can't even be discussed. Um, but I would like to do that. Um, I, think, I think there is a huge risk in, for every young child in the PICU to become very have very disrupted socialization anyway and if all their interactions with other with adults particularly are are invasive procedures that is going to affect the way that they you know relate to other people play can be a real um healing part of that if play is an experience that is non-invasive that doesn't involve pain it doesn't involve somebody touching you and fiddling with you and play, and then if you can start to introduce play when that is happening then that is very, very valuable. I think I'm seeing that more acutely that children who've not really had any normal socialization for quite a long time are now even more affected by this environment. But it's a risk for all children. And I think that's the thing to kind of remember. COVID has just yeah. made it more acute. I actually think too that I see this a lot in when I meet kids in the outpatient setting. Um, and some of that is probably that our babies typically stay in the hospital for a long time after birth. But um, kids who come into clinic after, you know, having six months or a year since their last clinic visit really are showing a lot more signs of um, fear. And their parents will be like, yeah, they haven't seen an adult that they don't know in six months. Um, and so that's been a real challenge. Um, we have noticed the like language development in kids who are seeing primarily people wearing masks. We really do encourage um, our hospital allows parents to remove their masks when there are not healthcare providers in their room and we do have private rooms. Um, so we really encourage parents to take advantage of that and to close the door and take their mask off when there is no one there so that kids have the opportunity to um, see their face and hear their voice and see their mouth moving and all that. In a few circumstances, we've been able to um, get a hospital approved clear mask um, to wear with our face shields um, that then they can see you talking to them. They're quite expensive, but um, if a patient is in the hospital for a significant period of time and they're primarily seeing healthcare workers, we've been able to do that. Thank you. And there's some lovely comments here. Um, we've got a Brazilian nurse, 
Edmara who's saying um, she loves to play with kids and thank you for such, thank you so much for your talk. And Joelle from Singapore. Hi, Kath and Carrie, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. How, uh, how, um, how do you manage the difficulty of having 40, 40 beds, Carrie, and just one of you? Do, you? do you train nurses to play? What kind of resources do the unit need to obtain to facilitate play for children? I imagine it's probably common across both of you there are, that we need to have 10 of you rather than the one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it never feels like there's enough to go around. Um, and, you know, yes, everyone can play. And I think that um, one of the ways when there's 40 beds and one child life specialist, it's really to evaluate, like, where is the specialized eye for play needed? And then where can I set other people up for success? Um, we for a while did not have volunteers in the hospital, but our norm is to also have volunteers on our unit and we do train them to play. Um, and so, you know, many of our volunteers are students in child life or students who intend to go to medical school. So they have an interest in um, the setting and the experience as well. So we, you know, we utilize them for play. We train nurses to play. And then I would really focus on the children who need the most specialized support to play. Yeah, same. I think the key is prioritizing and you do that as the day goes on, that your priority list at nine o'clock in the morning is very different to your priority list at three o'clock yes. in the afternoon <laughs> because the day changes all the time. But actually that is the, and, and that's, you start to learn that from your training, really. You watch mm -hmm. other play specialist doing that and working it out and then in each new area that you work in you figure out what does the priority look like here mm -hmm. so I'm always asking you know I want to know is the child on their own is the child an openly anxious or, or parent actually is there anxiety around for this family is the child having a procedure today and when is that likely to be and please can you call me you know those sorts of you know that those key things and then and then maybe once those children have been seen or I've just got a sense of when things might be happening then going around and seeing actually how are people doing this child who was very much asleep yesterday is now very much awake so they will need different things today and there's a lot of leaving appropriate baskets of toys or books or whatever with families in the hope that they that, that will be introduced to the child it doesn't it's not it doesn't have to always be me I do have one cupboard of um open access play resources that's just always being you know tidied and re replenished or whatever <laughs> and then off the water perhaps more slightly more specialized or larger pieces of equipment but really it's about what the need is and that that is about communication through the whole team um you know I can I will go around each day but actually if somebody can come to me at the beginning of a shift and say these three are the three children that we really needed to see today. That's actually much more helpful. Yeah. Well, I would guess the liberation bundles, Carrie, would, would support that because that gives you that guide, that gives you the priorities. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm very aware of time. We're 10 minutes over <laughs> and we've not had your cases. So can you please, I hope those cases have been submitted to IFPIX for the conference because we'd love to hear them. <laughs> been wonderful. Uh, thank you both very, very much indeed for your presentations. All six continents were covered and attendees, so you have reached wow. the world, okay? We haven't made Antarctica yet, but you know, we'll try. So well done.